listening to Clarity on Fire, a podcast for people who know what they don't want out of their life and career, but aren't sure what they'd rather be doing. In a world where it's easy to exist, but hard to feel alive, we, Kristen and Rachel, two certified life and career coaches, are here to help you cut through the information overload, get unstuck, and focus not just on how you can have a career you're passionate about, but how to create a whole life that feels fulfilling. So join us here, where we serve up inspiration and down-to-earth wisdom in a way that only two best friends can. We want you to experience the relief of knowing that, yes, you're allowed to want more out of your life and career. And no, you don't have to wander through the dark anymore. Our job is to light the fire that shows you the way. Let's go. Um... Last night, I had a dream that you were dating Woody Harrelson. And when I told you, you were like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> I love Woody Harrelson. I think that's great. I'm but, not sure my husband was like that so much, but I, I'm into the idea. <laughs> I mean, Woody Harrelson's a great guy. He's he is. He's so funny, funny. Yeah. and charming and just chatty. I mean, no, I'm, I'm into it. Okay. Well, I can't, I, I like, I had to tell you the truth that I had a dream about you dating Woody Harrelson. I couldn't play any tricks on you today. I know it's April Fool's Day. You and I are in agreement that April Fool's Day is stupid. I hate April Fool's Day. And I will not be playing any tricks on you, even though you're very gullible and a very easy mark. I still won't. Probably why I hate April Fool's Day. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. I, I don't like pranks. Corny. I think pranks are weird and awkward and uncomfortable mm-hmm. and and hurt people's feelings. Yeah. I just feel like, like why? It's just, it just feels mean. <laughs> Uh, I'm thinking of New Girl, though. Where <laughs> well, yeah. Frank Sinatra. Okay, that was funny. That was funny. Okay, his pranks are like the tiniest thing that nobody they're notices, too- yeah. or they're so big that it it's like offensive. Uh-huh. Yeah, that yeah. so that's that's good. That's in that's like subverting the idea of a prank sure. and making it actually funny. Yeah, that's exactly. why New Girl is funny. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I mean, happy April Fool's Day if you celebrate it. <laughs> if, if you, you acknowledge, celebrate if you acknowledge this holiday. I don't acknowledge I don't. It. I don't. Let's just move on. Um, okay. So, oh, okay. Before we jump into Dear Rachel, I, I sometimes forget to do this, but today I didn't. Uh, it is one of those months where we have five Fridays. And when mm. we have five Fridays in a month, we spend uh, the last Friday on a bonus book club episode, which we haven't done in six months because I think the last time was like New Year's Eve or something like that. And we yeah. don't podcast on the holidays. It's like the only time we take off. So it's been, it's been a months. long time. Yeah. It's been six months since we read a book. Uh, well, no, I've read lots of books since then, but <laughs> on the podcast. the podcast. So we decided, well, it just came out the classic already, of course, everything mm-hmm. Brene Brown writes is the classic. So we are reading Atlas of the Heart for our book club this month. So if you want to um, read it and follow, you know, read it and like then hear what we have to say about it or hear our thoughts about it at the end of the month, you can, or you can just show up at the end of April and hear our Cliff Notes version of what we thought about Atlas of the Heart. Yeah, you never have to read the book, but because it, we're oh. calling it a book club, we should at least give you the option of reading it with us if you want to. And if you have an HBO account, mm. she just had, I think it was yesterday, I think it was the end of March, she had the Atlas of the Heart, like, um, like speaking, like, thing that oh, she produced so for good. HBO. So it's like a live, um, I don't know how long it is. I don't know if Her it's a series or if it's just, yeah, series it's like a special, was, like was, a fantastic yeah so she did a special for hbo around atlas of the heart so we're definitely going to watch that before we record the book club too so you mm-hmm. can also just watch that if you want to you can read the book and watch it or one or the other or just or just wait and hear what we have to say i appreciate renee brown for doing those i mean i know it's a win-win because it's like she's making a lot of money oh sure and <laughs> and she's getting her message out to lots and lots of people but i appreciate it because i think it's so hard for some people in your life who might be like, I don't know about personal development to be handed, like what amounts to a textbook about emotions, which is what Atlas of the heart is, but mm. you could totally get someone to sit down and watch an HBO special with you. Like yeah, a reluctant it makes it spouse or more something. accessible, so much easier. So I think Brene Brown. Brown is so good when she's speaking. on video and speaking. Yeah. Um, I know that she's mentioned before that she prefers that she's more of a speaker than a writer actually yeah, i and i would agree and her personality comes out she's so funny and she's so relatable so i think that's a good way to introduce people 
or maybe just a good way for you to consume the content if that's what you prefer. Yeah. I guess not all of our people who listen are avid readers. I just think a lot of them are. I think a lot are, but if they're listening to a podcast religiously, then they probably would like an HBO special. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, we're going to do that too. So that's what this month will be about. Yeah. I'm glad we remembered to remind you all because we don't always do that. And sometimes we're like, surprise, it's a book. (laughs) Whatever. Okay. But today is a Dear Rachel. So we have three questions like usual. So should we just dive right in? Yeah. Question one. Hi, Rachel. I'm asking this on behalf of my mom, a lovely lady who's having a hard time knowing what she wants as a career. She tells me that supporting her kids, my brother and me, is enough for her happiness. I am not fully convinced, especially since I've seen her consider other career options in recent months. I'm grateful she supports us, but I feel like she deserves to be in a career she actually wants to be in versus just making money to support us. What should I do? Should I let her just figure it out on her own? Thanks in advance. From Concerned Daughter. First of all, I just love that. (laughs) It's so, it is so thoughtful. It is so sweet that you really want your mom to have a full life. And that's the energy behind this question. And I just, I think that's fantastic. So I want to. And I wish I knew how old this daughter was. I I mean, I don't know. Are you 18? Are you 22? Are you just like 38? And you mean emotionally support, right? Like, I I don't know. But it doesn't really matter because, yes, thank you for being a thoughtful kid who cares about her mom's fulfillment. So we have multiple takes on this. One is that ultimately you're never responsible for someone else's journey. Okay. It's totally valid that you want your mom to be happy, that you want her to be fulfilled, and you can't take responsibility for someone else's life or someone else's realizations and their unhappiness. And it's, I know it's really hard to watch someone struggle and maybe you feel like you have ideas or solutions for them and they're not ready to receive it. But that's also part of being in a family and being close to people is being able to sort of breathe through the discomfort of them working things out for themselves and maybe never quite working it out. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to rob them of that journey because usually that's where the awareness and the clarity comes from is not from a not from a single conversation with someone where the spark of insight descends on your mom and now she can move forward. Right. And that's what we want because we, we want, we want for the people in our lives. We want them to just figure it out because we want them to go off and do the things that we think are going to make them the happiest. We also want them to stop making us uncomfortable with their discomfort. True. Some of it is trying to relieve ourselves from the burden of like feeling like, I need to fix this person because it feels so uncomfortable for me to watch them be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. That's part of it. We can't deny that's usually part of it. But her figuring out for herself what she wants is the only way she's going to actually figure it out and then believe, believe in whatever she decides and feel confident in that. Yeah. So with that said, I also want to throw out there because we are the creators of the passion profile quiz. And so I feel like it warrants mentioning here that she might be a different passion profile than you. And that might be why her, her idea of what she wants through her work is not the same as what you would want for yourself. For example, if you, first of all, if you don't know what we're talking about, please stop everything and go take our quiz. It will take you two minutes <laughs> and you'll have much more of a sense of what is going on in this conversation. But for example, your mom might be a thriver, in which case work might not be the most important thing to her. It might not be where she gets her greatest passion and fulfillment. And she may not even care that much if she works or doesn't work. I know a lot of thrivers who, if they didn't have to work, they probably wouldn't. Yeah. I mean, and they would prefer that. And that wouldn't feel like a loss of, of some big fo- source of fulfillment in their life because they'd have a very full life with no work. So yeah. that might be that might be her profile, in which case she might be perfectly fine. And if you she might doesn't, be misunderstanding her. And you might have you might be a profile where work is a, a way you prefer to get a lot of your passion expressed and your fulfillment. And it just might not make sense to you. 
but that's fine. She might be wired differently. So that's one possibility. Yeah. It's also possible that she's a thriver who is in a toxic work environment or is struggling at work, but it doesn't mean that the solution is she needs to find her passion. The solution might be she needs to find a job that will suit her thriver needs, but just in a healthier environment. The solution is not always I need to find something I love and throw myself into it with abandon. That's not always the solution. Which is the solution we all think it is. And the one we get told, well, just find your passion and just throw yourself into your passion and then you'll have all your needs met. Yeah, we'll talk, to, we'll talk more to the third person. More recent side chat. <laughs> also, we have, a, we have a question coming up about this too. So we'll mm -hmm. get back to this. Um, so your mom's not you and maybe she's sincerely struggling or maybe you're interpreting that she should want more because you want more, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're right and she's wrong for being how she is. We just don't know. Um, and you don't have to completely just shut up and stay silent and let someone struggle. In my experience, because Kristen and I have been coaches for a decade and uh, we've, especially with our moms, like we've sort of, we've never coached our parents. We've it's not a good idea moms. to coach your own family. No, but I have seen my mom personally um, grow a lot and have a lot of realizations and awakenings. And she actually did work with a coach at some point in the last decade, but just not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she's changed a lot. And I, I would credit some of it to just me dropping little seeds of good doubt. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is that when someone says, I don't know, I just think I'm too old for that. A good doubt is just, I don't think it's ever, I don't think you're ever too old to do, to make a change. Or I just heard about someone who's 10 yeah. years older than you who made a change and they're really happy. Yeah. And throw uh, perspective, sh little, little comments that can be perspective shifters yeah. or that might disrupt a little bit of their pattern around like not letting them get too comfortable in what they think is true, especially if you can see that some of the things they think are limiting them from yes. possibility. Yes. If you can see more possibilities for her than she can see for herself, that could be a real kindness that you yeah. could do is not to say you're wrong. <laughs> and here's the, and here's every reason why you should, this is, I'm no, you don't need to lecture about, her. <laughs> nope. I'm not even talking about making a case. I'm just like offering a slight disruption and then just walking away. Mm -hmm. Like, or changing the subject. That has to be true. I've seen a lot of cases where that's not true. Yeah. Or how true is that really? Just, or even sometimes asking a key question, just dropping a question that you don't even have to stay for the answer. Let her sit with that. Yeah. Oh, what would you be hoping to get out of a job? What, what do you, what would make you really happy? Or what's the point of working for you? Just deep questions. And she might just be like, I don't know. Great. Mm -hmm. Move on. You don't have to wait for an answer. But that's going to plant a little seed in her brain. It'll get and the it's things gonna, moving. It's going to grow. And that's a nice thing to do for someone who you know, you, who you really want to see them align with all kinds of things in their life, including work that makes sense for them. But you don't have the answers and you shouldn't not, have the answers. you're not expected to have the answers. All you're doing is asking questions and opening up possibilities. And she may or may not run with them. And that's okay. Again, if she doesn't, that's fine. Not but your responsibility. We've seen this. We've seen this again in our own families, in our in friends, in sure. all kinds of relationships yeah. where I'm not coaching someone mm -mm. because that's not appropriate. But I might ask a coaching question, I'm or not, I might yeah. offer a new coaching type perspective. I'm not always allowing the people around me to marinate in their own doubt, in their own not even doubt. It's actually to marinate in their own certainty about how life quote unquote works when I know it doesn't have to work like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it might take a while before that seed mm -hmm. that you plant grows mm -hmm. and it might never grow. And that's not the point. The point is how can I be kind to my mom and encourage her to live the life that suits her? This is it. Yeah. She has to figure it out, but you can, yeah. you can plant and a, some seeds. A big part of you planting seeds is you modeling. Like yep. just because you're the kid, I think when you get to a certain um, age, the parent-child relationship changes and that the child actually has a lot of power to model different kind of behavior that the parent might might want to emulate. 
and might be like, wow, if my kid can do that, why can't I? I have coached several mothers who tell me, I'm really inspired by my daughter or by my son and what they're doing. And they're going after things I never would have imagined going after. And it's Mm -hmm. making me think, what else can I do? I've, I've, in fact, we've, we've coached a multiple mother daughter yeah, we've pairs. had a couple of big <laughs> familial pairs over the years. Yeah. And often when one starts questioning what the, what's possible for them, that inherently encourages the, the other yeah. to do so. And so that might be all it is too is, hey mom, I'm really thinking about what I want and mm-hmm. what I'm looking for. And that that might plant some seeds too. Mm-hmm. So model it, just throw some, throw some uh love doubt bombs. <laughs> in her yeah. direction. Yeah. And then whatever happens, that's that's a, that's not your responsibility after that. I know that this is more of like a racial justice, like the context of this was more in like equity and racial justice, but the idea of making good trouble is what mm. comes to mind for me. It's like, mm-hmm. you can make good trouble in people's lives. Yeah. And like yeah. disturb their status quo enough that they never get too comfortable sitting in their disbelief about what's possible for them. Mm-hmm. So that's what I would say. And that will help your mom decide, do I really want a career that I'm excited about, but I've I've given up on that as a possibility? Or is that just not that important to me? And I'd rather pour my energy into other things. That's her that's her question to answer, but mm-hmm. you can throw some questions out there to help clarify. Also, uh, have her listen to Clarity on Fire, the podcast. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Again, you could be the next mother-daughter combo. <laughs> sure. <laughs> to get some coaching. Okay. Well, let us move on to question number two. Dear Rachel, in the first few months of working at my job, I got a lot of validation about my work. I was new and my boss, the owner of the company, was happy to have me on the team and wanted to make me feel welcomed and appreciated. I got employee of the month about five or six months into the job, and she would show off the end results of my projects at meetings and express her appreciation. But now those sorts of things happen a lot less often. I'm starting to worry that she's not happy with my work and it's causing me to wake up feeling anxious a lot of the time. Should I be concerned that my boss's attention and validation have faded? Maggie. Maggie. Um, (laughs) Maggie's an insecure. She's take a breath. She's feeling very insecure right now. I don't often have clear yes or no answers for people, but I have a a yes or no answer. Maggie, no, your boss is not. Uh, what, what was the exact question? My answer was immediately no. Should I be concerned that my boss's attention and validation have faded? No, no, no you shouldn't. The fact that, first of all, she was lauding you with praise and validation and showing off your work Employee for months and month. months yeah. at the beginning tells me she was overly impressed. She brought you in you obviously did such a good job that she was like, wow, this is blowing me away. Let me just really reinforce this great work. And at some point she's like, she's got this. Now I trust her. Yeah. She's doing such good work. I don't have to step in very often. That's like a dream. It's for actually a boss. the opposite. That's what's so ironic <laughs> about this question is that, no, you shouldn't be concerned. You should be totally at ease because it's clear she trusts you. Mm -hmm. Because if people are running a business and it's, I I think if you've never run a business, it's hard to imagine like what that, what the reverse kind of relationship feels like, like Mm -hmm. you're not someone's employee, you're, um, you're in charge of all of these employees and it's your business. But as someone who does run a business, I can tell you if I'm not talking to you, it's probably because I trust it's a good you sign. <laughs> to do exactly. It's, I trust you to do what you need to do. And I don't feel the need to constantly check in with you or micromanage you. And I, I do, I think it's a compliment to the quality of your work and how much she must r- trust you that she's now like letting you kind of go off on your own and do your own thing. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't mean that you're not allowed to want a little more validation than you're getting. Cause she kind of shot herself in the foot. She kind of like piled it on at the beginning and then it kind of faded away Mm -hmm. completely. And now you're left like going, what the heck? But I think we need to get clear on where the line is between what's a healthy amount of validation to desire and what's just coming from a place of insecurity. And you don't really need as much as you're craving. I was going to say, at first I was going to say, there's one of two ways we can take this. I actually think we probably need to do a little bit of both. I think there's two angles to this. First of all, to some degree, there there does need to be 
the internal work of whether or not I get external validation, I know I'm doing good work. Mm -hmm. And so I don't let the presence or lack of external praise inform my belief about how good of a job I'm doing. So building that confidence and lowering the the insecurity that comes from needing yeah. that from other people, yeah. that has to be part of this work because that's getting yeah. triggered. You're getting anxious. You're waking up in the morning anxious. That's a sign that there's some insecurity growing and, it, and it's seeking that external praise to temporarily lower it before right. you need it again. So that's that's a whole other conversation about how to <laughs> how to develop that. But I, well, that's, can uh, I make a comment on how to develop that? I, I think so. I think that a first step would be helpful for her well, at least. You know, I love my dating analogies. So mm-hmm. let me whip one out right now. I think that this is the equivalent of being on a you know being in a relationship or maybe early on with someone, and you're like looking for every sign that they're going to break up with you. And you've basically handed them all of the power to decide how this relationship goes. And I would love it if instead you flipped the perspective and went, wow, this person is lucky to have me. And I am a gift to all people on this dating app. Or, you know, I'm, I am the lottery ticket that this person has cashed in in this relationship and look at all that I have to offer and look at all they're benefiting from having me around like take some of your power back oh I can already feel people getting squirmy just how you said that because people start to feel like I don't want to be egotistical oh I don't some of you be... need some of you are so like lacking in ego that a little ego inflation is a healthy thing exactly and there's a dip there's a very clear difference between I'm inflating myself up and considering myself better than other people no. versus I think I'm great. And, and I'm, I think other people are great too, but I think I'm fantastic. I'm and I equal. think you hiring me would be a great service to your business. I think I would bring a lot of great things. I know I do good work and you'd be happy to have me. That's the level of confidence we're talking about. I like myself. I believe I contribute a lot. I think I have a lot of inherent value. I think I have a lot of talent. I think you'd be stupid to break up with me. That, <laughs> right, that's, exactly. That's the kind of that's not egotistical. That's confidence. It's just confidence. That's it's confidence. just believing in and liking yourself. So part of part of that is part and, of that is is a needed a needed reaction. Yes, and here. the and the healthier level of confidence you possess, the less obviously validation you need to seek out from anybody else. So what then does a confident person do when they're feeling a little bit maybe not unappreciated, but a little bit unseen. They want to be a little bit more acknowledged mm-hmm. for the work that they're doing. This well, is actually making me think about a conversation we had in Discord with our our Patreon our community. Patreon community, which if you're not a member, check it out because we have a lot Always of a link really in interesting deep conversations in there all the time. Patreon. We were talking about <laughs> shameless plug. We were talking about love languages at work. Yeah. And what might be true here is you might be a words of affirmation person. So yeah. even if you're feeling really confident, you receive love and appreciation when people tell you or you do a good job. Quality and, time. Because your boss has yeah. kind of stopped spending as much time with you. Right. Maybe that's, be that. Yeah. Could be that. And or maybe it's gifts, right? I like to be acknowledged and and get, I liked my employee of the year. I award. liked my award. Like, that made me feel great. In which case you might you might need to ask. For a little bit more of that. Ooh, Just like I can hear and feel ooh, the uncomfortable feelings uh-huh. emanating from that too. Mm-hmm. Well, and again, if whether it's in a relationship, whether it's in a work, I mean, really it's any relationship. That's what a love language. Right. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a, a, a romantic partner or not, your love language follows you around. And the way you receive that and the way someone typically likes to give that might be different, in which case you might need to let them know this is what's really motivating to me. And you you could have a conversation that does not have to be confrontational. In fact, it could be, I think, very positive, very pleasant to say, at the beginning, I was, I was so motivated. You were sharing some of my work and letting me know how impactful my work was. And I trust that's probably still going on. But when I don't see that or, or, or hear the results, it makes me it just, it just, it's less motivating to me. So 
if something is really good in your eyes, I'd love to hear that. I'd love that positive feedback. That's helpful for me. And it's really motivating for me. Mm-hmm. You'd probably be like, oh, great. I can do that. I yeah. love doing that. That was, that was great earlier. I can, yeah. I can bring more of that in. I would just call out like, I know you trust me. And that's probably why it went from this to that over yeah. the ensuing months. And I really, I'm, I'm very grateful for your trust. And I do love a little bit of feedback. I do love a little bit of validation, don't we all? And every once in a while, it would be great if you just, you know, gave me a thumbs up or, or whatever. Yeah. Makes me want to do my best work. Confident people are direct and they're able to ask for what they need. Mm -hmm. That's how this works. Yeah. So it will be a little uncomfortable, but it will be worth it. And I actually think it will have, it will open up a great conversation with your boss. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Let's get into question number three. Dear Rachel, is it weird that I'm yet to find my passion at 29? Everyone around my age seems to have their lives figured out, and it just feels off when someone asks me what my passion is, and I don't know what to tell them. That is from L. No. <laughs> Again, we have very clear answers L. this time. No. <laughs> it's not, not weird. weird. Where do I even begin? Because I feel like this question is forcing me to sort of give my entire theory about passion, which I don't think that we have the space to do here and now. Let me say, first of all, there is no such thing as the quote unquote right age to do anything first and foremost, but to have discovered one's passion, quote unquote, uh, which I don't actually think is a thing the way that you think it is. No, there's no right age to have done that. We've worked with people of, I mean, from their teens to their 60s. I don't think we've worked with anyone in their 70s. Not no. when they started working with no. us. But mid-60s? Yeah. yeah. Trying to figure out what am I passionate about and what do I want to spend my retirement yeah. doing? Right. Everyone from literally 17, probably the youngest, to 65. Mm-hmm. So no, there's no right age to figure it out. Also, let me take real umbrage with your point about everyone around me seems to have figured it out. I'm like, L, no, they haven't. I promise you, they have not. They have they not. might be putting up a really good front. Yep. They might even think that they have at this moment. And then they're gonna be in for a rude awakening in 10 years when they're having a midlife crisis or mm-hmm. whatever. Most people who are really doing the work. Okay. So I don't mean people who aren't attracted to this podcast (laughs) because people who like personal development, people who want their career to be more than just a thing I like doing, but I want my career and my whole life, my relationships, my friendships to be an expression of who I am on a deep level. I want to feel really deeply satisfied and fulfilled. The people who have those deeper yearnings do not often have an easy time, quote unquote, figuring it out because they want so much more from it. And because it's so much more nuanced when you dive in on that deep of a level. So the people who say they are satisfied, especially when they're still in their twenties, what I'm finding is that either they're in for a rude awakening later on, or they're just not that deep and it doesn't take that much to satisfy them. And you're just not one of those people, Elle. I, I'm doubting that these people around you are telling you how fulfilled they are and how they're like, you're, you're doing a lot of interpreting, I'm guessing, because that's what we all do. We look around and say, well, that person must've figured some things out because they have this thing that I want. And this other person has this thing that I want and I'm behind. I can't tell you the number of people who come into coaching thinking that they are behind. And again, it doesn't matter what age they are. Because we've coached every, they all think they're behind. I have people who are at every stage of their career, every stage of life, every age, who all think they're behind. First of all, statistically, there is no way that's all of these people are behind. Also, behind what? Some of them are in front. (laughs) (laughs) They have to be. And some of them have lapped people and feel and still feel behind. Exactly. Well, but that's what happens when you lap people. Then all of a sudden they're in front of you and you're like, wait, why am I behind? And you're like, you're not, I'm ahead. <laughs> <laughs> We're all going in a loop too. That's what's so crazy. It's there. I don't even know if there is a behind and in front because what is the scale we're working with here? What is the right age? That's a good question. 
What would you say is the right age to have figured out your oh, I passion? Know, I know what Elle's going to say. 18? No, 30, because she's 20. He or she, <laughs> I actually don't know. They are 29. So th- mm. that, they're going to say 30 because that's that's the next milestone. They think they should have had it figured out by 30. Why? I don't know. Propaganda. Some kind of propaganda. <laughs> it's a nice, you clean know. age. <laughs> yeah. You're an adult. Like, you can't say that I'm not at that point. And other people seemingly younger than L have figured it out, quote unquote. And so they're thinking, oh my God, like I'm going to be a real adult. I'm getting old. Ah, I need to have figured this out by 30 and I haven't. Cue panic attack. We have not a lot of people who come to us at 29. Have you noticed? I have. We, we've had like sort of like an above average number of 29 year olds sign up for it's coaching true. It's because true. it causes an existential <laughs> crisis. So I think L's in that, you know, mm-hmm. oh crap. I'm like having a, maybe not a quarter life crisis. Um, I mean, unless you want to live to 120, do your thing. <laughs> do you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but maybe like a like a third life crisis but or something. On the whole, on average, I would say if you're having that existential crisis, you probably are early. There's True. a reason we call it a midlife crisis. You're not at midlife yet, L. So maybe you're ahead of the curve. Mm-hmm. It's all pers- it's all relative. That's what we're trying to say. All of this talk about behind and above and like, what is the right <laughs> above. <age? laughs> above and below? I don't know. We're all over the place is, is meant to have you question this whole idea of what does this even mean anyway? Yeah. Because you could look at any different, no, any number of people at any stage of their life, they're going to feel ahead or behind or whatever. And we don't know what to compare to. And so our internal doubt about how successful we are, it's going to default to, I must not be far enough ahead. It's a version of I'm not enough. That's all it is. It's just, everyone has their own version of the deep insecurity. I'm not enough. And sometimes it takes on the flavor of, I haven't done enough or I haven't figured out enough, or or I'm not far enough ahead. Something that I don't. But if everyone feels that way, you're actually in great company. (laughs) Yeah. This is a normal feeling and uh, don't allow your insecurity about where you're at to paint an inaccurate picture of the world around you. Cause I can assure you uh, everyone else does not have it figured out. And the people who think they do, well, they might be a very, very, very rare bird or they're avoiding work that they will eventually have to do later on. Or they just ain't that deep and you don't have that much in common with them. And it's like trying to compare watermelons and potatoes. Mm-hmm. Like technically they're both viney plants that like grow on the ground or whatever. But like, other than that, we do not have much in common. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to throw out there that taking up valuable mental energy, feeling behind and judging yourself for not having figured things out steals the mental and emotional <laughs> energy that you could devote into that deep questioning, that deep work. What do I, why am I so focused on, should I have figured it out by now? Instead of what can I do now to get clearer on what I love it's and what a great way to procrastinate actually doing the, the real work. It's like, well, as long as I'm worried about not having done it, I don't have to do it. <laughs> and really what it is, is I don't know what to do. Right. Or else I would be doing it. So you've landed in the right place. Yes, obviously. Hello here. Uh, You've come to the right place. So let me give you a pro tip. I can't give you all of them, but I'll give you, I'll give you a little bit to get started. Um, Your job is not to quote unquote, figure out your passion because your passion is not a thing. It is not a job title. It is not something that can be so easily quantified or put on a resume or put into metrics. Your job is to get clear on who am I on a deep level? What do I value? What do I desire? And how do I want my life and my career, but not just your career, right? My life as a whole, the different facets of my life to be an expression of who I know myself to be and what I desire. That's your work. That's an, oh, great. I can't just go to a, pick up a book and it tell me five steps on how to do that. Nope. Unfortunately, this is a deeper um, inquiry that you have signed up for, but it means that you're an evolved person. It means that you're probably are ahead of the curve mm-hmm. <laughs> in terms of where most people are at. But that's the, re- that, like the reward of doing that deeper level inquiry is being able to find something that you are really excited about and that you're capable of actually enjoying and 
squeezing fulfillment out of. Whereas most people are just going to be like, oh yeah, I like my job. It's okay. And then as soon as that job goes away, they're like, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I want. Cue and the existential, cue crisis, existential crisis. Also go back to our side chat from last month for more on this, because we had a whole hour where we really delved very, very deep into the kind of nitty gritty of making your career, your whole identity. Mm-hmm. So, so I hope Elle is feeling better because we've just told her, I think Elle is a girl's name, but I don't know. Well, no, sure. it was just EL. So I really don't know. Okay. That's well, how they spelled it. We have no idea. Okay. Well, I, I hate to make assumptions. Elle, I hope you're feeling better in that you're not behind and you're in the right place. And you're clearly someone who is deep and willing to do the work. So all of that tells me you are exactly where you're meant to be. Yes. And you are primed for deeper levels of self-understanding and alignment with who you really are and what's going to really yeah. fulfill you. You're right. You're right in the right place. But your focus needs to change. Your focus needs to be less on, I don't know what to tell people when they ask me what my passion is. Guess what? The I'm a good enough writer to know what the subject of that sentence is. And it's not you. It's the <laughs> other people. What do they think about me when I say that? Your focus needs to be on, well, what do, what do I want? Not mm-hmm. what do I want to tell people? Because that, again, I'm getting the sense that you're, you're more fixated on, on how it looks and what other people are going to think, which makes sense because when you're focused on that, you are focused on your place on the timeline. And you're right. like, again, comparing, feeling, feeling behind means you're doing a lot of comparing. Mm-hmm. So your focus needs to be less on comparing to where other people are at. It's not relevant to you. I promise. And focused on your own deeper inquiry and what do I want and who am I? And if that confuses you, well, we've given you one podcast episode. You can go back and do the side chat from March. Um, and like, you come to the right place. Hello. This is all we do. This is. This is what the passion profile short course will help you start with. This is what coaching is all about. Like, it's why we're here. So, yes. marinate in this. Welcome to good company. Yes. Welcome to <laughs> finding your own answers. You are in the exact right spot. Okay. Um, well, I'll also link to some other. I've thought of a lot of episodes as we were talking today, and I'm just going to link to a bunch of them in the show notes for L, for Concerned Daughter, for Maggie. Anything that kind of popped for me as we were listening, um, as we were listening to ourselves talk, <laughs> <laughs> I'll link to in the show notes. As always, let us know if this resonates. Yes. If and... you are one of our people or if you are someone who just really hardcore related to one of these questions, leave a comment. Um, link to that's always in the show notes too. And we love getting the Rachel questions. So if you want to ask a question, Know that in every single show notes of every single episode, there is a link so you can fill out a form to ask us a question, or you can just email us at contact at clarityonfire.com subject, dear Rachel, and you might we'll get, get featured it. on the next episode. You never know. We love answering questions. This we is do. one of my ambitions fulfilled is to be an advice columnist. And now we are in audio form. <laughs> <laughs> the best kind. <laughs> don't have to do nearly as much work. It just gets to talk. Mm-hmm. I don't have to edit it. It's great. Um, okay. So I hope you guys got something out of all that. <laughs> I'm sure you did. A little nugget one. Um, <laughs> and we will be, uh... we'll be back next week oh, with yeah. a normal person interview. I'm really excited about this one. So many of you are going to love her, relate to her, be inspired by her. She has achieved one of her lifelong dreams. And we're going to talk about what that was and the whole journey of making that happen. I hope that you talk about what it's like after achieving a lifelong dream. Maybe not because she hasn't quite like... We didn't because she's still in it. Yeah, that's true. Right now. Yeah. We might bring her back. (laughs) Yeah. I feel like we also had an episode at some point about what happens after your dreams have come true. Like, Mm. hmm, that's an interesting... Like, what? hmm, do you need new dreams? I might... If I can remember that, I'll also put that in the show notes so I can figure out what I'm talking about. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Okay. So we will see you next Friday for that. Bye.